Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. You guys are the eye and build. There is no eye and build, but you guys are all here, and it's really, it's really you guys. We do so much as a team and so much as an industry, but it's the people who, the butts in the seats. So really, thank you guys so much for being here, and I'm so excited for our next presentation. Kenneth has been a dear friend of mine for many years. We're both part of the Sony Alpha Collective. We've gotten to travel and see some, some mountaintops. We were just at the peak at 11,000 feet over in Utah. But Kenneth is here to talk about some cityscapes. And I am so inspired by his work. And I think you guys, as landscape photographers and as New Yorkers and the people who are traveling into different cities, there's a lot of inspiration to find. And Kenneth is here for you guys. So without further ado, Kenneth, come on, hit the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. That was very pitiful. Now, we have not been in the Javits Center in four years for a photo convention, and that's the best that you all could do. So I'm going to try it again. Good afternoon, everybody. That's better. There we go. There we go. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm from the south. I'm from Atlanta. And you all know that we, we have a lot, of, a lot of churches down there. And a lot of pastors are kind of notorious for taking a long time. So I'm, I'm trying to con consolidate myself to this little space here. And I have my notes. And so I'm going to try my best to stick to my notes. How well will I do that? I don't know yet. But we're just going to go with the flow. So for time's sake, let's just go right into it. So today, I'm certain that there's not a single photo that you'll see featured here that isn't of something that you've already seen or captured yourself. If your expe expectations are to be wowed and amazed, then I can't promise that that's how you're going to feel at the end of this. You'll quickly learn in this short time that I have you that I'm not driven by trends, but driven by feelings and exist in this art world of photography for the memories. In my multitude of genres of photography I photograph in, Today, I'm going to confine myself to just travel photography. As a travel photographer, there were many directions I could take you today. And even now, I'm still uncertain just where that might be and where we might end up together. But I'm hoping wherever that should be, that you'll feel that the journey was a thrilling one. The beauty of travel is experiencing the unexpected along the way. And hopefully, that will be your experience you're a part of today. So to kind of get it started, something I've never had the opportunity of doing is actually sharing about how in the world did I even get here? You know, a lot of people, if you, how many of you all actually know who I am and follow me online already? Okay, so we have a few, kind of half and half. So if you're familiar with what I do, you probably have seen my work for the last five, maybe 10 years. But there's an error after that or before that that goes another decade. I've been at this for 23 years, and I don't look a day over 24. <laughs> so going back and looking at my history, we have to go back to the year 2000, to an RV trip that I took with my great aunt and uncle, Marjorie and Jimmy Smith, and three cousins to Toronto, Canada, and Fairbanks, Alaska. So this is a photo that I actually took. And it's a very aged photo. Many of you, even those that have been following me for over a decade, have probably never seen any of these photos. So you're actually seeing photos from my history that I've never shared before. So much of my childhood was spent in this big bus, even a lot of my adult years. And every experience was truly a memorable one. Not always because of the places we visited, but the comedic element my family always brought to these trips. That alone is a presentation in itself. My aunt, whom with great sadness passed just in early May of this year, is the one who helped me get started in photography. She gave myself and my cousins on the trip these incredibly advanced cameras, which were truly revolutionary for their time. And I actually happen to have one right here in my pocket today. So many of you all may know this as just a regular old disposable camera, a Kodak Fun Saver. But that's what all of these pictures 
were taken with back then. In typical Marge fashion, she gave us simple instructions. All right, you guys, fill them up. That was the only instruction she ever gave us. At that time, I, of course, didn't know I'll continue filling up cameras for the rest of my life. Over the course of a decade, I had the opportunity to see some amazing architecture across 30 states and Canada, like the CN Tower that you see pictured in the middle, the Gateway Arch, St. Louis, Missouri, or some of the amazing castles that we found as we were crossing Canada. At this time, my imagery was simply to remember. Remember all of the places I would visit and be able to look back at those images and think of the stories I have of events that took place of my travels. Within that time, I finally did upgrade from this gloriousness here. And I upgraded to my first digital camera, which was a Kodak C613. And I obtained that camera in December of 2007. Another great aunt, Mary Blossom Gang, gifted me that camera for Christmas. And this came right on time as I used this to photograph my events and friends during my final semester as a senior in high school. When that new semester started in January 2008, I was fortunate to be in an advanced economics class with an amazing teacher by the name of Pat Roberts. She happened to notice images I captured around school and thought I should consider a business in photography. Now, I'll be honest, I was a little naive. I didn't know that people could even have a job in photography, to be honest. I really did not know that. But I thought she was crazy for suggesting it, but I never questioned it because she never steered me wrong once since I've known her. She thought I should place my images online and just see what the response would be. A few months after this, she helped me start my business as a graduation gift. I thought there's no way I can operate a business or even know where to start. I thought I'd go off to college and let it go and follow my dreams of going into meteorology, physics, or computer science. Clearly, if I'm standing in front of you today, you kind of know what route I decided on taking after all. And that would be 14 years later. So in looking, I wanted to put the faces to the names that I've called out. These are the four people that I mentioned to you. And I've never had the opportunity to mention them publicly and share my thanks on stage about them. And I wanted to do so today. Because many times in life, we continue with our lives and forget about where we came from and those who helped us get us to where we are. It's also why I mentioned them by name, is I want you all to know these people and the impact that they had on my life. What a blessing they've been, and I'm grateful for what they've given to me and allowed me to be where I am today to teach and encourage millions over the years. So getting into it, my real first admiration for architecture came 10 years ago here in this very city with my first trip being in November 2013. Now, I was someone that admired the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center. Can anyone even think of why I had such admiration for the Twin Towers? Probably no one would ever guess it. It was because of Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. I had a desire to visit the towers then after. Unfortunately, that didn't transpire. But after the fall of the iconic towers in the city, I continued to learn about the towers the designers behind them, their construction and methods for creating those towers. Towers that were actually hated before they were even built. But once they were gone, they were towers that people of New York could never forget. So with the building of the new World Trade Center complex, I said that the first place I must visit is the World Trade Center. I didn't know how I would happen, how this would happen prior to the time, but as fate should have it, I was on a road trip to New York from Atlanta with my god sister and brother. And the place that we stopped at upon arriving and where my feet would touch the ground first here in this city was in fact at the World Trade Center. 10 years later, one could say I may have become a little bit obsessed with the World Trade Center complex, 
particularly with the One World Trade Center itself, and having more photos of that building than anything on Earth. Don't believe me? Well, let's take a look at a few of them. So here we have one that I absolutely love that is captured from the Brooklyn Bridge. This one is captured from looking through the fencing of a dog park, just a, a little blocks north of One World. And then, of course, this is a very popular frame that's right in front of the Millennium Hotel. We keep going. We look at this reflection shot looking down Fulton Street. Here's another Fulton Street shot where I'm using the lamppost with the train line services here at the location for framing on this very nice foggy evening. And then this is from Jersey City at the 9-11 Memorial there, framing One World Trade Center. Yep, there's more, there's more. This one is from Brooklyn Bridge Park. This is another next to Millennium Hotel. And then this one is an aerial shot from a helicopter just above Brooklyn Bridge of the lower Manhattan skyline. Now, I wanna point out to you that what you just saw, that was 11 pictures of the World Trade Center. So I'm giving you a little bit of a hint. I want you to keep that in mind, 11. So everything after this point, you have to keep track of yourself. And we're gonna see who's paying attention. How many times does one World Trade Center appear in this presentation? That's how I can gauge who's paying attention. So, <laughs> you don't get anything for reciting what I just said. So, this is just scraping the surface, but I'm giving you that total now. So, I guarantee you, this building is going to appear more times than you all get alerted in your email of your bill is due. So, just, just keep that in mind. So let's get to the main question at hand. So what is the key to archi artistic architectural cityscapes? Now, there's so much that I can fill in between all of this, but for time's sake, we're just gonna keep on moving. For me, the first is the beauty of architectural photography in general is the admiration for the architects who have the vision, the mindset to dream, to create and place on paper these masterpieces that thousands then bring to life in a physical structure. As a photographer, it's one artist admiring the work of another artist. I feel it's my goal to capture these amazing structures in a way that captivates those who view them. Not only by the photograph and editing itself, but for the art of the majestic creations that they are. Capturing images is beyond just a click, but it's a connection a connection between you and your subject, and in this case, with structure. What is it that motivates you to capture a building? You may ask, what moves me to capture so many images of One World Trade Center? It's because I had an admiration already established for the building to where it became a part of me. So being in New York, we're surrounded by a plethora of buildings, with iconic buildings as the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, and uh, again, One World Trade Center. There's also amazing buildings such as our transit stations. You have Grand Central Terminal, World Trade Center's Oculus, or incredible bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge. So one of the points that I always like to tell people is visualize the shot before you even capture it. You know, before you put that camera up to your face, Look at what's around you because you're there in that moment and you can actually turn around, see what's there to really see what, what makes for a perfect photo at that moment. So we take a look into the question at hand and keep in mind that everything shared is to give you new or additional ways for you to go about capturing your own artistic architectural masterpieces. Take everything and make it your own to where it's comfortable and meaningful to you. Our journey today places the art and stories behind them at the forefront without the technical side of things. Knowing the settings, cameras used, lenses used should not be what you think about today, but of the connection I had with the scene that brought me to capturing them the way that they are. Now, if you simply must know what the settings are and what was used for every photo, 
then you'll find them in the bottom right corner in transparent text for your viewing pleasure. They are so transparent that even I can't see them. So as we take a look into some of the work that I've done, this is a photo that is from Edinburgh, Scotland. And it's an iconic view of the city, of the Stuart Monument that's there. Whenever I travel, I always want to get an iconic image of a city with a beautiful sunrise or sunset with amazing clouds. As you can see, we're only up to one of three of those right now. It's a nice photo, but it's not the one that I had visualized in my mind of wanting to capture. Now, because I have a limited window, I only had five days here. So of what I wanted to capture, I either had to just take whatever and say, if I don't ever come back here, at least I have photos from that location. But this was taken on my very first day, so I still had four extra chances. Now, this was a little earlier in the day, and as you can see, there is completely clear skies, right? But it's still a relatively okay photo. But then you get to this one. That is what I was after. This is the same day, and I couldn't believe it. So after the first photo, I went back to my hotel, and I just happened to be on my terrace. Now, this is the middle of winter. Yeah, I'm outside on a terrace freezing to death. But that's the photographer in me. And I just happened to notice out in the distance that, wow, there's, there's clouds moving in. I'm like, surely they're not going to make it in time for sunset, are they? But they kept rolling in, rolling in, and it was coming in pretty quickly. And I was like, I think it's going to make it. Now, to get to this monument from where my hotel was, you're basically going on like inclines at that point, and it's a ton of steps. Some of them don't even have steps. You're just struggling, and if you have a ton of weighted camera equipment, that just kind of adds to your, your, your pain. Uh, let's just say that I, I nearly passed out to get this photo, but it was, it was worth it. It was very worth it. But that's what I was after, because look at the difference in the colors here. It's just such a much more beautiful photo. We look at photos like this. This is of the skyline of, of Dubai, of a beautiful sunset. And this was on my very first evening in Dubai. An image that I wanted captured that showed the majesticness of, of the skyline. For this, I found this hotel and reached out to them about having access to their hotel's rooftop. And they granted that to me. This sunset, um, was on the first day, and I promise this doesn't happen regularly. Some kind of way I've just been fortunate to wear on my travels the very first day. I get a nice sunset like this. Another image I did have hopes of capturing was the shot that you all see others capture that has like the fog where you've probably seen other images of Dubai and it has a lot of low clouds. Now, I didn't get that shot, but I at least got a very nice sunset shot. When we look at photos like this, where this is the skyline of Chicago, and I photograph this vantage point quite, quite often. So this is the Franklin Orling uh, Street Bridge in downtown Chicago. When I reached here and looked at the buildings, I liked the color palette, and I thought it would make for a nice sort of metallic looking photo because it was overcast, you know, kind of very soft kind of vibe going on, the very soft light. And so I just took the little bit of color that I had within some of the buildings, left that in, but then sort of muted everything else. So you kind of have this nice sort of metallic kind of look to the image. So I always feel that when you visualize images before capturing them, you have more appreciation and connection with them. It doesn't just become another click, but another piece of art that complements you and what you saw and felt. The next thing is being attentive to light. And then in, in small text, I have bracket if needed. <laughs> so the reason I have that extra note is for moments when you have such a dramatic contrast between your highlights and your shadows, I always recommend bracketing instead of just taking one image and people typically will expose for your highlights and say, oh, I'll just bring up my shadows in post. No, don't do that. Because what happens is you introduce noise when you do it that way. And it's like, why not just take two photos or three photos and combine them at the different exposures? And you have the perfect photo right there. Nothing else to it. 
So I'm someone who is not a morning person, but when I'm somewhere that's beautiful, I have a little bit of motivation at that point. So this is a view of the HMS Belfast and Tower Bridge in London. No, this is not called London Bridge. Where I am standing is literally a few feet away from what is actual London Bridge. So not to be confused by that. I'm not a morning person by any means, but I had the motivation to go out to capture this, this photo with a friend. Now, the reason I typically don't like sunrises, which this is, is because they're harder to tell if they're going to be great or not. Sunrise or sunset, you can tell just as the day goes on, you know, you might see the clouds coming in. You kind of have a better percentage of getting a great sunset photo as opposed to a sunrise photo. In this case, just 20 minutes prior, none of this was there. The clouds weren't there. The sunlight looked terrible. And I said, you mean to tell me I'm on vacation and I woke up for this? That's the worst feeling when you're, you know, don't have to be anywhere and you wake up and the conditions are terrible and you're like, I could have just slept in for this. But I just stayed there for a while and again, the conditions just kept getting better and better and that's the photo that we had there. And so I, I use an app to kind of see where's the light gonna fall at this time of the year based on whatever location I'm planning to go to. And so I put, put it in and saw where it was gonna be the best and I said, okay, we're gonna go here and we're gonna see what can we capture. And that's what we came up with. So I was happy about that. But I, I, again, I wanna reassure you, this does not happen often. So let's take a look at some examples of where I take a photo just to take it in the event that if I never come back here, I at least have that location in my portfolio. So this particular day, I'm taking a photo of the old city hall building in London, and then you also have the shard that's there in the background as well. It's an okay photo, I guess. But the colors are not what I like. They're not my signature colors. And so, but I took the photo anyways. Days later, I decided to go back because I just happened to be walking around the area and noticed, wow, the light is really nice this evening. And this was the result. Big difference. We even got a nice little plane between the bridge there. It's just so different in terms of when you go out taking images throughout certain periods of the day. Now, a question that I'm always asked is people are, see my pictures and they're like, what is your secret? And I, I'm like, I really don't have a secret. I pretty much am an open book. I teach everything that I do. But I think the secret is just, if you notice most of my images, they're all taken at the same time of day. That's how I get my unique colors, sunrise or sunset. So when I go into post and edit those images, I can really pull the dynamics of those colors, the contrast, to get the images that you see. Whereas that photo on the left, doesn't look that great. But the one on the right, that's great. So here's another from Dubai. Now, I was almost late in getting to this location. I don't even have to look at my notes for this story because this, this was a priceless one. So this marina in Dubai has um, a waterfront and you can actually walk around the entire waterfront. And so the location that I wanted to go, I, I'd seen this location before, and so I used Google Maps to kind of drop the little guy and you know, walk around virtually to figure out where I need to go. Apparently I dropped them in the wrong spot because what ended up happening is, if you look on the far left of the frame, the walk path actually goes that way, but I came from the right. I crossed three streets. I don't know what kind of buildings I went through, I, I walked for a good 45 minutes to take this photo and sit there for sunset. At the end of sunset as I was leaving, I decided to go out the opposite way. Would you be surprised that had I gone the opposite way from the start, it was only five minutes to this spot instead of 45 minutes? I was, I was not happy. I literally stopped put my tripod down, and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But I was like, this photo better be worth it. 
for all this walking that I did. Every now and then that happens, you know. But I treasured the images more because I wouldn't have had that story to tell if I went the correct way. And fortunately, I, had, I built in enough time to where I didn't miss the sunset either. So here's another from Dubai where I'm on one of their, their trams. And I just happen to be looking out the window. They have driverless trains there. So you can look out the front and the back of the windows there. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I saw the light. I wasn't looking out the window. I'm just looking in the train car. And I'm like, where is this light coming from? And I turn around and I see this shot. So I didn't have much time to take it because their trains kind of go a little bit quickly. So I just took my camera and took that one shot. And this is the only photo I got of that. So if I needed a redo, I would have to wait for another train going the opposite direction and then get on another train on the opposite side. That probably would have been another half hour. So I wouldn't have had the same light. And so that's a come in situations like that. It is good to be ready, you know, have your camera in your hand or on your shoulder, whatever. So that way, when you see moments like this, you're, you're ready to take that photo. And this was the only photo that I was able to take from that. So these are some examples on how light changes the mood of your frame. The first, it's a nice shot of the skyline. And you notice that none of the building lights are on in that one. The middle one, we start having some of the building lights coming on. You see it on Empire State Building and um, a few of the lower buildings that's there in the shot. But then on the far right, you have a drastic difference where we're later in the evening, we have those nice hues, those nice red and orange hues, and then we really see our building lights. And so this is from Top of the Rock, and a lot of times when I go up there, I go up early because if anyone that's ever been up there, you know if you don't confirm what spot you wanna be in, someone's gonna take that and stay up there for a long time. I'm that person, just by the way. So I will camp out for a good four hours. So if you think you're gonna take my spot, you got another thing coming. So I do that because you know, I, I wanna get the best shot that I can while I'm at, at, you know, at those locations at that time. And so it's just very different feels. Now I'm not counting them for you, but just to point out, see he's paying attention. World Trade Center, that's another hint. There's three right there, three separate images. So moving on, finding light doesn't have to always be about finding sunlight. It could be a nighttime photo too. So I just happened to be walking. I was on the underneath the Manhattan Bridge of Brooklyn Bridge Park and walking back going south. And as I'm walking, I was passing this pier and I just saw this bright beaming light. I was like, where in the world is this coming from? But I liked it because look at the shadows that's, that's coming off in front of it. Anything that walked in front or was in front of that light just had a nice shadow cast that was coming down. And so I just politely, I still had my camera on my tripod, and so I just politely put my tripod there and just took a, a nice long exposure of what, what was there. And so this is not with a star filter at all. This is just using a, a small aperture, I think maybe about F13, F16 to get that effect. Because when you use small apertures and your light source comes into the lens from a certain way, it will create that effect on its own when you use a small aperture. So you don't need a star filter to do that. So the next thing is analyze your subject and surroundings for framing. And then in small text there, capture different angles. The next thing is take advantage of inclement weather. So I'm one who, the only time I'll go out to shoot is when it's bad weather or it's overcast. You know, many of you all here can probably relate where it may be a clear blue sky like it is today and someone may say, well, why aren't you taking pictures today? Because the conditions are terrible. You know, you get the washed out colors. I mean, it's bright. There's, there's not much that's there to where you can really get those popping colors. But when it's overcast or there's like snow, there's rain, Oh, you're gonna find me outside for sure. So this is a, an example of that. So this is from Gantry Plaza State Park. And I was out there for a couple of hours and it was just an overcast day, just a regular overcast day. And I'm walking around just taking pictures and then all of a sudden it just started raining out of nowhere. 
but I did not go inside. I'm like, oh my gosh, these conditions are so great. I even did an Instagram live. It was one of the best lives that I had that I wish I had saved, but I don't. But just look at the sort of moody feel that you get from this photo. You know, you got the low clouds. You know, it's a very mysterious looking photo. And so I pulled back to where you see the focus can go anywhere. Is it whatever this framing is of the pier that's in the shot, that's the subject? Is it the skyline that's in the background? You can make up your mind as far as what's the focus of this image. And I feel like that's the beauty of these big majestic architectural cityscape images. People's eyes can go wherever you direct them to based on what you capture in the frame. So here's another utilizing inclement weather. Now in this case, I actually was, was covered. This is from my balcony of where I was staying in Miami. And I was photographing some sunset images when all of a sudden these low clouds came out of nowhere and it just was a torrential downpour. My, my cameras get wet. I, I definitely take my, my gear through a lot. They've suffered a lot. And I have one of my girls over here on stage. For those that know me, you all know that I named my camera. So this is little Ariana that's over here. And Aaliyah is downstairs, so I do have my twins with me. But I, I, I definitely take them into some places that they probably shouldn't be. Probably a little rough on them than, than what I should be, but they've never failed me. So I love them for that. But just another case of you know, taking advantage of the inclement weather because that just gives you such a unique viewpoint. Okay, going on, let's look at this from Paris. So many of you all have seen shots of the Eiffel Tower, I'm sure. And if you've ever gone, everybody and their mother is going to take this photo. <laughs> They're gonna take a shot of the Eiffel Tower centered some kind of way. And that's, again, the iconic shot. And yes, I have one too, because I at least want that picture in my collection as well. But I always take it a step further. I want something that's different that somebody else might not have. So in this second photo, I found a building that had a nice reflection. And, I, and so sometimes I, I don't even use my camera. I just get up, I'm like, that, well, that looks like it'll, it'll make sense. Let, let me put my camera up now and take the shot. And so that's how I, I go about it sometimes, you know, just walking the streets and seeing what I can find to take a general composition like the image on the left and see how can I be creative and make it my own by getting images of what you see in the center. Now this next one is a fun one because from where the image is on the left, I just happen to notice a flock of birds flying around. And one thing I always wanted, I, I've seen a lot of people share these images on, online where they have these nice scenic images and a bunch of birds flying. And I'm like, one day I want to have a photo like this. And I was like, is this my opportunity to get that on this very day? So I just went, you know, maybe 100 feet from where I took the image directly center. And I framed it and I just waited. And sure enough, the birds perfectly aligned and gave me that gorgeous photo. So you see the difference of what we have from just your traditional standard image, that centered down the middle shot, but then look at just analyzing the scene of what's around, how you can make something that everybody has seen, that everybody has captured, there are millions of photos of this, and make a creative shot and make it something that's your own. So when people see the other two images, they'll know that's you. But if you only shared the first image, well that could be from anybody. So this next one is the Cultural Education Center that's centered um, in Albany, New York, and upstate. And so framing it here, as I was walking, I noticed these agency buildings that are on the right side. And then the left building is the Corning Tower. And so the water was so still that day, and I'm looking, I'm like, I want a reflection of this. And so I just framed it to where it was perfectly centered, and for this shot, I used, I think, a 21 millimeter lens. So I didn't want to go ultra wide with this to where I still wanted people to really see what was there in the scene. Like, I wanted, wanted you to see that building in the middle. But then I still wanted it wide enough 
to where you have the nice framing of the building that's surrounding it. And it just makes for you know, such a, a beautiful reflective shot. So that's what I, I mean about analyzing what's around. See how you can frame what is around you as you, you know, do a full 360. You know, something that I always tell people of, of what I've been now teaching people is if you go out and take a photo and you see a subject, yeah, go ahead and take that photo of that subject. But then once you take that picture, don't change it. Look at what's around it. Because you might have another frame that you don't see that can actually frame the frame that you have. And so this is an example of that. Someone may take this and just take the center building. But then in opening it up and looking around, I just made that picture bigger. That's looking at what's around, the different architecture that's there. So for time's sake, oh, I'm actually doing pretty good on time. That's rare. So here's an instance of looking at my surroundings. These two spots are literally side by side. I just happened to see this puddle of water and decided to get a really low angle shot of Elizabeth Tower. And then I happened to walk over just up, up the top of some steps that was right at the end of where I was and just framed the light post of the Westminster Bridge. So very different shots utilizing what's there to frame my subject. So yes, my subject here definitely is Elizabeth Tower, but look at how I added the environment into the frame to kind of give you more depth, to really have, you can go anywhere. You know, where does your attention go? Is it the people that's in the shop? Is it the leaves that's there? There's a lot that's going on that can direct your eyes to something different. So being in New York, we're surrounded by a ton of buildings. And I always tell people, as you, you know, we're, we're always so on a one-track mind that we're just looking at what's in front of us. We don't take the time to look what's beside us, behind us, or above us. Sometimes just looking above, you have some of the best images you could possibly take. And so this photo was taken, this is on the block of 42nd and Madison for those that are interested. Very nice place for some good lookup shots. If you have a really wide lens or a fisheye lens, that's a good block to photograph from. Here's another. And let's see who points that out. I'm not gonna say anything. So here's one from Lower Manhattan, looking up. This time, I decided to include a street post. Was it necessary? No, not at all. The buildings themselves were nice as it is. You know, there's a lot of great structure that's downtown. But I just happened to notice this lamppost. To my amazement, I shared this photo on Instagram. And I'm still trying to understand why there are 8,400 people that like the photo of a street post and some buildings. Still haven't figured that one out yet. Say that again. Lines. It's the lines. Interesting. I'm always curious to know, like, what? Why is it that people are, you know, what, what brings their attention? So I like that he, he mentioned that, that, that it was the lines. That was the first time I've heard someone say that. That is a 12 millimeter. That is ultra wide, very wide. Exactly. I didn't even notice that. Very good. Hmm. Oh, see, we all see something different in that one photo. I took the photo. But at the time, it's like, I'm just looking because it's something different. I'm looking up. There's a lot happening. But in just three different people, they all saw something different from that one photo. That's the beauty of art. We all see something different. There's no right or wrong behind it. That's true. So she, she was saying that, you know, there are a lot of times that People just don't see what, what's around. It's, you know, it sort of changes our perspective. You know, I'm the photographer that took the photo. I see one thing, but then as someone else views it, they see other things. So kind of segueing into the focal length question. Determine the focal length and lenses. Why is this important? Well, for one, I own 14 lenses. And if you're like me who loves using prime lenses, then you're not able to carry all of those lenses. So you really need to know 
what do you need to take? Emphasis on need to take. Because a lot of times we'll take a whole bunch of extra stuff and what do we end up doing? We only use one lens, but yet we have eight lenses in our bag. So it's like really understand, view things based off the focal lens. Some people wonder how I do that. I actually have uh, this, this wonderful young lady here on the front. She's one of my workshop attendees. And we did a workshop and you know, I could look at a scene and figure, I know what focal length is needed for that particular scene. And she's my witness to that. But it's like I just have kind of trained myself in that way to see things through focal lens. So that way I take the guessing away and I can actually focus on capturing the art, focused on whatever my subject is. So looking at some examples really quickly, I'll just put all these up there on the screen. So the left shot, <laughs> let's see how, how many people have pointed that out. Let's see, I see some people snickering. They, they're figuring that out now. So uh, of course, we have one World Trade Center. So the first image is a 55 millimeter, and that's taken a little bit closer to the Brooklyn Bridge. But then I decided to change where I was and go a little bit closer to the, the municipal buildings and also still took a 55. But then I looked, I said, if I get a tighter shot, then I could just focus on the building itself. So the far right image, that's with an 85. And I cropped in a bit just so that way you had the World Trade Center with the gorgeous sunset. And so on the far left image, I knew that I could only use a 55. Why is that instead of an 85? Because of that building that's in the front. Notice how much taller it is than One World. Whereas on the middle image, notice how the building lines are pretty even in height. So I could come in tighter and not worry about cutting off a building at that point if I were to use a different focal lens for that. So it's like, just, just look at the, the focal lens. Here's another example. This is of Chicago, of the elevated um, Chicago transit system. This is using a 25. In this image, that's with an 85. Notice the difference between the two. Notice the continuality of the 85 millimeter image. You don't see an end in sight. That's how I can get away using the longer lens. Notice the image on the left has a stopping point, has that S curve, and then there's more buildings at the end. So if you use a longer lens, your shot comes to an end quicker. Whereas the one on the right, it just looks like it's still going and going because you have that depth. In that instance, you could use a wide lens or you could use a tight lens. Just depends on what kind of story you're trying to tell there. All right, moving on. Here is a shot from Paris. Jumped ahead of myself there. So this shot is at 16 millimeters of the Louvre Museum in Paris. And I wanted this lady that was standing there taking a photo in the middle. And I liked this lamppost that was on the side. So I took it really wide at 16. But then I was like, well, I don't want anything that's like on the side of me either. So I came in a little tighter and used 24 and then made the lines a little straighter on this as opposed to the previous shot. So again, you know, different focal lens, different perspectives. So then the next thing is use a tripod when necessary. This is for those moments when you want to use longer exposures. Use semi-automatic or full manual. This is necessary for when you want to change exposure for a more creative or dramatic look. And then next, manual focus for sharper results. So let's look at some examples. This is the downtown Atlanta skyline, probably one of only two vantage points that you can actually get a nice shot of the skyline. I'm from Atlanta, so I can talk about our skyline like that. Um, definitely not compare um, a skyline you can compare to New York at all. Um, and here, these are manual focused and these are on a tripod to capture the, the trailing lights of the traffic down there. You know, the buildings by themselves would have been great, using a tighter lens, getting just that skyline, but backing it out and including the interstate in there and having that long exposure to where you see the motion of the cars, it just really added to the photo. In this photo here, it's a panoramic of Lower Manhattan from the Brooklyn Bridge Promenade. And in this case, because it was such a majestic photo, I decided, you know, I don't do this often, but 
I just made it a panoramic photo. So this is eight different images and then stitched together to make this, this really wide shot of lower Manhattan with a little bit of Brooklyn in there too. So here's an uh, example of why you would want to use semi-automatic or manual. So on the left side, we have a silhouette. So in order to get that, of course, you have to under, underexpose significantly. Whereas if you were you know, in full automatic, the camera's not gonna be able to read this. It's just gonna see everything as normal. And so if you want to get something like that, you do have to set those manual settings to have either a silhouette of the skyline or in the other image, you see it's perfectly exposed because I brought that exposure back up. And then we have, of course, a New Yorker's hatred, Times Square. I always hate whenever I, I'm doing something and, and I've had people who come into the city for the first time and I always ask them, where do you wanna go? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, do you wanna go to Times Square? And I always love the response when they say, no, not really. I'm like, thank God. <laughs> so in this case, using a tripod again, you know, catching the traffic, catching the whole majesticness of Times Square, the busyness that we hate to endure if we ever have to walk through there. And this is, I believe, a 21 millimeter as well. So not ultra wide, but just wide enough to where you feel like you're a part of that image. So then moving quickly, next thing is get to heavily trafficked areas early. Can't stress that enough. And then in small text there I have, or photograph when it's cold. So, of course, many, many, many of us remember this, the, the vessel. It's still there, you just can't go up to the steps. Um, but it was one of those places to where it's like for sunset, people used to love going there and, and taking photos of, of this. So I used to camp out there too. Yes, I camped out a lot of places. So if you've ever gone to sunset at any of these places, you've probably seen me hogging up a, a particular location. And then this is Edinburgh, Scotland again. This is a, a tighter shot from that same vantage point that we started with. And again, this was just earlier this year, or I'm sorry, this was last year in December. So it was purely cold, might I add. But I didn't have to worry about the people there. You know, a lot less traffic, it's a lot easier to get the shots that you want if you can endure the cold. And then for this shot here, Again, we're looking at the museum in Paris and, you know, just a nice center shot looking at, you know, this is during winter, early in the morning. As you can see, there's not many people out there because I got out there early and it's early on a cold morning. So you don't have the people to deal with because there's, anyone that's ever been there, you know, it's a lot of people that go out to this museum. So next thing is photograph in raw for more control and then be creative in post-processing. So as you know, when you take photos in raw, once you take them off the computer, they look pretty dull, don't they? You know, a JPEG, you know, it's a processed image. So it has all of your settings that's baked onto that photo once it's saved to the memory card. You know, the sharpness, the, the brightness, the contrast, all of that is on a JPEG but not when you have a raw file. So when you go to put that on your computer, this is the result of what it looks like. You know, all of that is taken away and you have to add that in post. Now it's not a bad thing to photograph in JPEG. If you're someone that just feels like you've got everything dialed in, that's great. Use that. If you wanna take it a step further though, shoot in raw and really make the dynamics of your picture become greater. And this is what that result looks like. So that's the before and that's after. And when people saw this, this photo, everyone thought that I added the clouds. And as you can see, those clouds were there. All I do is take what's there in my photo and just exaggerate it a little bit. And so especially with the editing tools that we have now where you can do the masking and separate things and edit those things individually, I can do even more with my photos now. So this is downtown Chicago. That's the raw file. That's the edit. 
Here we have Brooklyn Bridge. And this is early one morning. You have the raw on the left, the edit on the right. And then there are instances like this, where you have a photo, pretty, pretty okay photo, but then do something creative with it. I Photoshopped just the top half of the photo and reversed it in Photoshop to make it look like that it was a mirrored image. So just give you something different, give you a more unique creative look with your image. And so lastly, use what you have. Now I know a lot of you are probably gonna be mesmerized. You haven't been at a photo convention in New York City in four years and you just see all this new gear and you're probably like, oh, where's my credit card? Where's my checkbook? I gotta buy some new stuff. I see there's AI and cameras now, there's new lenses. I gotta buy all of this stuff up to take pictures. No, you don't. No, you don't. Use what you have, even if it's something like this. Here's some examples for you. These photos, very nice photo. Every last one of these photos is taken with my cell phone. I shot it in RAW and edited it in Lightroom. Same with all of these. These are all taken on my cell phone. So remember to use what you have. And then just go for what feels right to you. The only one that's gonna know what makes a great photo is you. You know, people are gonna make comments, you know, we all know there are trolls on Instagram and things like that, and they're gonna say comments. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. People don't understand the feeling that artists have with their photos. And that's what comes sometimes, I, I don't like when people leave negative comments. I've never once left a negative comment on someone's image. And the reason is, I don't know what they felt when they took that photo. If you look at some of my older work, you'll notice that they were darker than what they are now. And that was because that's how I felt. It was a rough time in my life, so what I do is a reflection of how I feel at that moment. And so in going for what feels right, the reason I put these two images up here is because there's a funny story behind this. So focusing on the image to the right first, this is, I don't know if you all have been to that new area that opened up just maybe a couple of months ago. That's where you can actually walk underneath the Brooklyn Bridge from the Brooklyn side. You could always do that from the Manhattan side, but you couldn't do that on the Brooklyn side. But now you can, you can go all the way around that pier. And so that right image is from underneath that. And it was a great photo. But then I came over to my right and came to where this left image is. And you notice there's some stuff on the lens, right? I wasn't planning on that. That just kind of happened. And I just want to point out that I actually had just came from church that day. So I was in a full suit. I'm in a suit and there's water on my lens. So you kind of see where I'm going with this. I got drenched with water because a water taxi sped by and sped very closely. It was probably hilarious for the people looking at me taking the photo, sure, and I was drenched. Like, my cameras got wet. Like, they, they had a nice salt water bath, unfortunately. One of my cameras even started acting, I'm like, oh gosh, I've never had that happen before. But it, it, it fixed itself, so let's hope I don't have any issues with it. But I like the shot, because I'm like, most people, if they saw that the water was coming up on that pier, they wouldn't even chance it. But I got that shot because I was willing to get my, my church clothes wet. And it was worth it. So I was like, I'm going to show that photo during this presentation because I got wet for that. So it's going to be seen by somebody. So in coming to the end, to those who are observant may have noticed that I didn't personally introduce who I was or what I do. And that was done purposely. For starters, I didn't want to take up valuable time that could be spent sharing about what I know, what I love, and what just feels good to me. My hope was for my story career and this journey I took you on for 45 minutes, at least I hope it's still 45 minutes, and allow you to formulate your own biography of who I am as an artist and as a person. But if you must know, 
this graphic gives you a great visual to the kind of artist I am at the very least. So some final words to remember is by who I got into art from back in the mid 90s, Bob Ross. You can do anything here, the only prerequisite is that it makes you happy. Look around, look at what we have. Beauty is everywhere, you only have to look to see it. We don't make mistakes, just happy little accidents. Of course, I'm sure most people probably know of that one. Ross believed that with enough practice, anyone could be an artist. And then finally, this one is from Maya Angelou that I really loved and I was like, I wanna include this one. And it said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And then lastly is one of my own. Art is an expression, it's an emotion that's an extension of oneself. If you remember anything at all from today, remember, remember that. What makes art so special is that to everyone it means something different. And we each have our own interest in what we love and dislike. There are those who may have disliked the creation of many of these amazing landmarks when they were being developed that stand before us today, but many of them we couldn't visualize a world without. Today my hope and prayer is that you are able to either be motivated, maybe snicker at a couple of jokes that I made, and be inspired or simply feel my love and passion for what I'm truly fortunate to live my life and doing each day. And with that, I thank you. And lastly, if you have children that you know of or, or people who, you know, you have children of your own or you know of people who have children, get them involved in art. As someone who was growing up in school and started in art and then all of a sudden we no longer had the art programs, you know that art is usually the first thing that goes. So make sure that you are involving children because it's never, they're never too young to get started in art. Because look at where I am today of starting so young to where this is something that I love, it's something that I enjoy teaching, and I just hope that other people are involved in doing art as well. So I would just like to say thank you to B&H for inviting me. And then to close, I'm going to ask the question, how many times did One World Trade Center appear in this presentation? The exact number for how many times the One World Trade Center appeared is 26. Nobody got it right. <laughs> With that, I thank you, and thank you, B&H, for having me.